Hi everyone, how is everybody doing? It's kind of late, right? Okay, let, let's try not to fall asleep. Let's see where we can take this. So, who likes debugging problems in production? <laughs> it's not a trick question, don't worry. Um, so, you know the, the slides, I could probably ask you like, which slide is coming next? Like, rate the sessions, uh, remember to rate the session, um, did you rate the previous session? And now we can get going. Um, and this is something that we see every now and then, that no matter what the actual question, the answer is Kubernetes nowadays. And that brings lots of joy to monitoring, observability, whatever you want to have. So let's see what we can do that there. Um, I work for Elastic, the company behind the Elastic stack. Maybe you're using our stuff already for logging and monitoring. Um, so let's see what we can do here. I have a very simple application. So if you're using Spring in the Java ecosystem, though, the application is not relevant at all. Like, we have this application, um, you can find somebody, so for example, you can search for Franklin here, and you could find a person, and then if my search loads, if my internet is connected, it should find Franklin, maybe, or not, yeah, no, now. Um, you can see their veterinaries, which will load in a second, and you could also cause an error, and then something bad happens. And that's as much as we care about the application, basically. It just, sometimes it's, it's slow, sometimes it produces errors, and we want to see what is happening here. Um, before we dive into the application right away, let's take a quick look at what we have built here. And we won't look at too much of the code or anything. Basically, we have kind of a, ingress from Kubernetes, then we have the front-end side of stuff, so we have a React application backed by a Node application, and we have three of those running, and then we have two back-end services, more or less. So we have a Java application that is talking to MySQL, and we have a Flask application that is talking to Elasticsearch. And maybe remember these graphics, because we'll kind of like get back to the structure, like these applications is, are talking to this, and these applications are talking to that. But the other stuff that we're kind of most interested in are basically these little squares here, because this is then the monitoring part that we will use. And I'll show you as we go along more about the monitoring part and how we do that stuff there. So if you hear Elastic Stack, probably you have something like this in mind. So these are the components that you have. So you have the beats, which are like lightweight agents or shippers. They're basically shipping information off like could be files, metrics, network data, security data, any, anything like that. <coughs> you could have Logstash to do parsing and enrichment. What do I mean when I say parsing? Just shout. You, you could just have, for example, a log line, and then in the log line you have a timestamp and a log level, and you might want to extract those that you can filter down on those. Um, what is enrichment? For example, you have an IP address and you want to have the geolocation of the IP address. So you want to get the geo point to say like, these are all the users coming from Denmark today and just segment down on those. So it could be adding metadata. But metadata could also be stuff like Kubernetes or Docker metadata that will be much more interesting for us today to add that. Because you might be interested in just give me a specific namespace or give me the information for one pod or I am interested in one specific base image. All of that could be metadata that you add to your events. So the log itself doesn't really know or care about that, but you could add that as you go along. Then you can ship everything into Elasticsearch and Kibana can visualize that. So let's see what we have here. So where do we normally start? Oftentimes logs, I guess. Who is using some logs to debug production? I guess that's also pretty much everybody. And I hope it's kind of centralized and you're not using SSH and tail anymore, right? Well, you, you, you never know, because we, we still see that every now and then, and then people are like, yeah, maybe this is not the right approach. So, if I come to this application here, um, you can see I have a lot of logs in the last 15 minutes, or actually refresh, let's refresh that, and see what other events we have in that time frame. Um, actually, now we've properly refreshed, and now it's a proper amount of logs, like 200K in the last 15 minutes or so, which is probably too much to find anything in here. But just to give you a quick idea what we have here, or before we actually do that, let's filter down on that. So I spoke about metadata, and we could, for example, say Kubernetes.labels uh, app, 
and then I could just say like I'm interested in only one specific application that I have running here. And my application could be the server side of my pet clinic application. And my logs generally don't really know about this, but this is just metadata that I have added um, here when I collected it. And when I filter down on that, rather than having 200,000 events, um, now I only have less than a tenth or so, which is still a bit too much, but let's look at one of these um, entries here and what we have here. So looking at this one, um, server status, the message is something like this. What could this be? Or you actually see it down here already. This is an Nginx access log. So this is just what Nginx is logging. But maybe I'm more interested, for example, in my Java application than my Nginx access log. So we could exclude those as well. For example, since we have a lot of structured information in here, so you can see this here. This is the raw log that we've collected, and we've extracted, for example, the IP address, and we know where it was collected and what kind of thing it was. But we also added a lot of metadata, for example, the Kubernetes metadata here or we have extracted the Docker metadata in the container labels, labels, and here for cloud, we could see that this is running on GCP. How do I get all of that metadata? Well, where do we start? Let's, let's start with the Docker or container information. Where the, could my log file get all the metadata to enrich my log files? Any guesses? probably the Docker socket. So what we generally do is, um, in the log path to the container, we have the container ID, and we use that ID to actually query the Docker socket to get the metadata and then add it. In a very similar fashion, I get the same thing for Kubernetes, where when I get the data, then I have the Kubernetes API server, I just query that with the right ID and then get the metadata of that pod back, for example, um, to see what I have there. For the cloud metadata, where do I get the cloud metadata from? Yes, there is the metadata endpoint, which is, I think, the same for all, at least the three big cloud providers. It's always 169, 254, 169, 254. If you query that with curl, for example, you will basically get back the metadata for the container itself. So it will then tell you, hey, you're running on this cloud provider in this availability zone in this region with this instance ID, for example. And then you could figure out, oh, just this specific instance ID is down, or my availability zone just went down. Obviously, only add all of the relevant information and not just random stuff. But in our example, we'll make pretty heavy use of all of that metadata. So this is how we get that metadata here in general. And then, for example, I could say, like, I'm, I want to use some filters. And then I could, for example, say the, the way we collect some information is through an event module, and I want to say is not one of, and this will actually suggest what the options are. And I basically want to just exclude the Nginx and MySQL logs, which will then leave me with my Java application, more or less, here. So if I filter down on that, then we'll go from 16,000 events or so down to 10,000. And if I open one of those here, um, then you can see, yeah, this, this looks like a Java log, like debug something, something, something. Um, what we didn't cover yet is, how did I even get that information? Where do I put the forwarder file bit in our case to forward me the log file from my Kubernetes host? Generally on a daemon set. The daemon set is you have one instance running basically on every host. And that can then collect all the log files from that host. Just to give you a quick idea of what that looks like. So we have the file bit daemon set here. So kind is daemon set, where you make sure there's one instance running on every single host. And then basically I say, OK, this is the, the Docker image I want to run. You can pass in a configuration and some, some values. The, the main things down here are basically how to mount the data that you want to get. <coughs> For example, here, the Docker socket, we mount that so we can actually query the Docker socket to get the metadata for the Docker images. That's something that you define here. And then we have the configuration map where we actually configure how stuff is set up here. And here, for example, you see all we now need to do is we need to say, like, this is running on Kubernetes, and it will then automatically collect all the Kubernetes 
logs from that instance. And you don't need to specify any files and specify the path to those. You just say like Kubernetes and it will automatically know how to fetch those. I have added some <coughs> sorry, um, metadata or conditions that if something is, for example, the container name is nginx, then it should be treated as an nginx log, which kind of makes sense. So it will then know how to parse that file. For our log, let's have a look here. What we actually get from our application is this one here. Where do I get this from? From my log appender. So let's have a very quick look at the log appender just to show you what we're getting here. So we have spring pet clinic source main resources logback XML is what we use here. And this is basically the pattern. So this is what my application is basically spitting out. I write it to system out so it lands in the default Docker and Kubernetes logs. Um, so here I have the log level, the logger, and the message. And this is exactly what we have here. The log message, the logger, and the actual message. But here we have the log level nicely extracted. So we can filter down on that one, for example. How do I get from this string that I've been writing out to this log level here? How do I extract that field? Has anybody used our stack already? So if you've been using log session in the past, for example, um, what was the thing you were writing to actually parse log files? Anybody remembers grok, the named regular expressions? Basically, you could just write a regular expression to parse this part here. Who likes writing regular expressions? Anybody? One, two, not so many, okay. I always say this is the Stockholm Syndrome, where you, you get so used to writing uh, or doing that that you start liking it at some point. Just to give you a quick idea of what this looks like. So what we do is basically, and now we tie together, so this is the log form format that we are writing out, and then in the daemon set that I've just shown, or the, sorry, the config map that I've just shown you, we have the configuration. And what we have is, if I find it, we have here, if we say pet clinic server, this is basically my Java application. So if it's in that kind of Kubernetes application and it has that name, then use this configuration here. And this configuration here basically says like every line needs to start with one of these because otherwise it might be a Java stack trace and you don't want to break up a Java stack trace and collect that. Um, but what you also say is here, I want to use this Petnik server pipeline to actually parse this. And this is where we're putting the grok pattern or the regular expression. Because if I have here in these pipelines, um, it's Petnik server, this is what you basically do to parse this. So we take the message field. So this is the message field. We take this field. We apply this rule here to parse all the different pieces out. So you can see here, those who said they like writing regular expressions, you know what is going on, right? So you see the line is starting. This here is a grok pattern. You can see it starts with a percentage sign, curly brace, then this is the grok pattern basically. It's called log level, and we have a regular expression behind that how to know how to parse that. You don't have to write the raw regular expression. Grok is basically a named regular expression. You can reuse existing patterns. And what we then do is we parse the log level and we put it into a field called log level. And this is how it's getting parsed out nicely. Then we have a space. And then we have, for example, we have some string. And we put that into a field handler. And at the end, anything that is left, we put into a field reason. For example, if you look here now, um, reason, this is exactly Closing, JPA, Entity Manager, this is exactly what is left. So this is how we have parsed that. And this is how you can do that with parsing. If you don't like writing regular expressions, there is, by the way, another way to do that. Um, the one that we kind of would recommend. Um, no, this is the wrong slide. No, where's my slide? This is the slide I want. Um, you can also log structured. If you write out JSON logs directly, you can just consume JSON logs, or even if you use CSV logs, for example, it would be much easier to parse. So if your application, regardless of the programming language, spits out JSON logs already, you don't have to parse them again. Because it's kind of stupid what we're doing. My application knows what all the different fields are. 
then I write out one line to disk, then I fetch the file or the line from disk, and then I parse it apart again. If you write it out structured di directly, you can skip all of that parsing magic around it. So that would make your life easier. And there are various libraries, one from us, but those are from others. These are just Java examples, but all the other major programming languages have some log appender that can write out proper logs as well. Um, one thing that is also interesting here is, let's get back to the config map. I'm doing one other thing here. Tags. This is basically a custom field I'm attaching. So basically what I could also do, rather than saying I want to have the infra demo, or sorry, the, the pet clinic server, and I want to exclude Nginx and MySQL, you could just look for the tag pet clinic server, because this is the tag I'm adding specifically when I know I found a Java log. And just to show you how you can also work with logs, um, we have this other view here. This is called the so-called logs UI. Those who like tail F, will feel right at home. Because here we basically have a live streaming mode, and this will just keep streaming all the, the logs. But we can also filter here. For example, here I can just use these tags, the field that we have just seen, and I can then say, it will even suggest like all the options we have. I can just say, I'm only interested in the pet clinic server. Um, that is the tag I've added here. If I apply that, you can see now we only have the Java logs, and you can see it just keeps streaming. And the nice thing is, even though we have thousands of log events happening every minute, um, unless something goes wrong like now. Ah, this is not good, because this is a, a proper online demo. Um, let me check. Yes. I guess we... Yeah, we're good again. Um, so yeah, if you are not online, then suddenly your logs are gone. Um, I hope they are reappearing now. Um, maybe. Yeah, looks better now. Yeah, it's, stuff is happening again. Um, so now you can see here, I can turn on the live streaming again, and you can just see streaming the subset of things that you have filtered for here. So whatever you have in the metadata, or even in the full text of your logs, you could just search for that and then watch it stream by, which is very handy if you have some bug and you're trying to debug something in production and you want to see the right logs for that. Um, or you could just say, for example, if you have the log level extracted here, you could just look for any debug message or, or error messages or whatever and filter down to those things. Um, so this is helpful if you have any errors. But sometimes you also have other problems that people say like, your application is slow, which is one of the worst things because slow can mean a lot of things and it's very hard to debug. Um, one thing that we have now as well is APM or tracing. Is anybody using any APM or tracing tool? Couple, okay. How do I get that into my Java application? So tracing is basically um, you add something to your application that will watch calls coming in, and then it will follow one call along throughout your application, can be even be across services. It will follow that along, and then show you at the end, like, what called what, where did you spend your time. It will also extract stuff like maybe HTTP headers when you called it. It might show SQL queries. It will show a lot of the details or the call stack of what you have gotten in your application. Um, so how do I get that tracing into my Java application, for example? Or who is generally using Java? Okay, a good bunch. How, how do I get an agent into my Java application? Normally, we have this concept of dash Java agent that you can just add at runtime. Um, so you just attach it. It's not a build dependency. It's just something that you add when you run your application and want to instrument it. Um, then you can just add that at runtime. Where do you put that? Maybe. Um, Potentially in the Docker file. So we have a custom Docker file. If I would see it here, uh, we have a Docker file, and this is very hard to see. Um, I don't want Word right now. Um, what we want to show here is this is basically the configuration that I have here. And what I have is at the very end, this is my application, and somewhere here, even though I don't see, th there's a Java agent how, how I basically set it up. And then this is all the configuration you need. Otherwise, your application doesn't touch any agent-specific things. It will just hook into your application and extract the data. 
For other programming languages, it might be a build dependency. So for example, if you use Python or React, it would be a build dependency that when you build your application, the agent will be added, and then it will extract at runtime the metadata. And what you basically have is, first, it figures out what services we have. So these are all the services that we have. And then we could just look, for example, at the Java application, but we can look at the others as well. And you can see this seems to be going pretty well, like, <coughs> Over time, you can see where you spend your time. It's like 50-50 between application and uh, database. There are no major spikes, so this looks okay. And then further down, you can see how long do your calls take, like average, 95th percentile, and 99th percentile. And you can also see how many requests per minute are you doing on average. So here we do it, I don't know, 20-ish to 30-ish. Um, 200s and one or two 400s for pages that were not found. And at the bottom here, you can also see this is, in Java terms, this is the class and this is the method that has been called. And you can see a, how long does it take to call that and how many times is it being called per minute. And here, this impact at the end is basically we multiply the transactions per minute times how often it's called. And the idea is that this will show you where are you wasting most of your time. So if you optimize the things that are being called most often and that are slowest, this is probably the point or the things that where you should start looking into, is it fast enough for what I'm trying to do? Um, and we could, for example, look at get owners just to get an idea of what is, this is collecting. So you can see this is where we're spending our time here. So here the database is spending, or we're spending two thirds of the time in my database now. Maybe this is not what we want. Um, we can have a look into that. Uh, you can see how long the transactions take. Here you see basically an aggregation, like we had 1,900 requests or so that were very fast and took like up to 23 milliseconds. But we also had one request here that took around 300 milliseconds. But that's still pretty decent for most applications. Um, what we can also see is for this batch of calls, we have the call stack down here. So first, you can see this is what is being called, for example, here you can see the endpoint. You can see it was a 200 that came back. Um, and then you can see, for example, all the header parameters um, that came with that. But what you can also see is this weird pattern here. What do we have here? Yeah, we have this, especially if you use some ORM tool, you have this N plus one pattern, like you do one database call and based on the result of that, you start calling another database call to fetch more information. And then you do another call and then another, which is normally not very good for performance because you will have lots of back and forth with the database. That's also why suddenly here, we're spending way more time in the database basically than in the application. And we could even look at one of these here and look like, this is the actual query that we are running. And then you could check, like, if it's a slow query, should, should I optimize the query? Or in this case, probably we should look into not having this n plus one problem where it's more and more and more database calls as we go further down. So this is stuff that you can very easily see. But I've also prepared another scenario in a specific time frame here where our application might look something like this. So here, we see some very weird pattern. You can see here, my application every now and then has this spike where it's very slow. Like Generally, it's fast, but every now and then it's slow. And OK, the requests per minute are pretty stable, so that doesn't seem to be the issue. We could also zoom into this one. For example, here, I could just mark this error, uh, area, and then it will zoom into this one. We could even zoom further in. And you can see, OK, here there is a clear spike where the response times are just very high. And it still get on us, but Overall, lots of these are kind of slow because all of them are kind of higher than they used to be. So I'm not, bless you, I'm not really sure what is happening here. And also the calls are pretty stable. But this is not like a big like cooking show. Obviously, I've prepared something and I've prepared the right dashboard to show you what is going on here or to get clues, basically. So what we have here is... This is a dashboard that works for my application because I know I have four services. I have the Python application, I have the Java application, I have the Node backend, and then I have the React frontend. So these are basically the four applications that I have. You can see how many instances I have running, um, number of users, percentiles of response times, etc. And for example, now if I look at the 99th percentile, you can see we have these continuous spikes here, which is not what we want. 
And at the bottom here, I have basically an aggregation of all the different services together. And now you can see here we have these spikes. And now I could, can look at the applications. Like, is the React application kind of correlating with these spikes? Not really. Is the Node application correlating with that? Kind of yes. So you can see here, this one spike has this spike, this spike matches this spike, this one here, this one. The Python application has spikes but different ones, so this is not the right trace. The Java application has, again, the same spikes here. If you remember from the very beginning, the architecture diagram that I've shown you. Maybe you remember. Um, how was this connected? What did the Node application and the Spring application have in common? What could make both of them slow, but not the Python application? Let me bring that one up. What, what do the Java application and the Node application kind of have in common that the Python application doesn't have? Yes. Um, and this is a pure coincidence, of course, now that MySQL is slow and not Elasticsearch. Um, but this, you will see in a moment why. So maybe this is something we might want to look into. Um, the, first, the other thing that we might be interested in as well is we might just look at resource starvation, like how are we doing resource-wise on our instance. So to look at that, we have another visualization here that's called the, the infrastructure UI. Basically, you can see, so this is not running file beat, but metric beat, and this is pretty much like getting the data that top would get you. It can also get application metrics and other metrics, but this specific view here is pretty much what the Linux top command would give you. And it's just sending that forward um, to centralize in Elasticsearch as well. So these are all the hosts that we have running. And actually, this filter should not be applied right now. These are the, all the hosts that we have running. So we have six hosts in our Kubernetes cluster. Um, we can see these are all the pods that we have here. So this is 76. And then we have a couple of Docker containers as well. But this is not all I have for my application. This cluster is running multiple applications. So I want to dive into my specific um, cluster again. And again, we use the metadata to filter down on that. So I can say Kubernetes, if my browser would cooperate, labels Kubernetes app. And this one here has the infra demo. This is basically filtering down on this specific demo. So now you can see just the Docker containers for this one or just the pods. And you can see this is the CPU usage and one is sticking out. Um, you can already tell from the name what this one is. This is a database. Um, we could also look, for example, at the actual metrics of this instance over time. Um, once it's loading. Um, and you can see here, this looks kind of okay. I'm, I'm not really sure. Like Network traffic looks okay. Memory usage is pretty stable. Um, CPU usage as well. But I'm not sure, maybe, maybe this is misleading and maybe, maybe this time frame is too short and maybe we should go to this time frame. I don't know, let's, let's pick this one, let's see if we see more. And lo and behold, you can see every now and then we have these weird spikes which might correlate um, with the slowness in our application. Any guesses already what is up with our database? Well, we'll see, um, because I've prepared another thing here. Um, this is basically a custom dashboard as well. Like this view and this view, this and this, these are all pre-built. Like this service analysis dashboard I've built just for my application. And this MySQL dashboard is also custom built, but the others pre-exist. So what I've done here is I've combined multiple beats outputs so you can see metric beat. So metric beat can basically query MySQL and get the statistics from MySQL to see where it's spending its time. And you can see this is like how many open tables, et cetera. Um, I'm also getting from all my instances the CPU and memory usage here. And you can see that's a lot of instances, maybe more than I, I can visually see. But I've also included here the MySQL performance. And we can basically get that from PacketBeat. So PacketBeat is like Wireshark. Who's using Wireshark? Those are the desperate days, right? When you have no idea what is going on anymore, you look at the output of what is Wireshark producing. And we're kind of doing the same here. So Wireshark basically has this timing information and it knows like, this is the query sent, 
how long does it take to send the answer? And you can see spikes here. For example, here you can see suddenly you have weird spikes that sometimes your MySQL queries are just slower. And you can also see processes and network traffic. Network traffic still looks pretty OK. Um, so I don't see any outliers here. Processes look pretty OK as well. What I'm interested in now is I want to zoom into one of these slowness spikes of my database. OK, let's zoom in a bit more. And now you can already see, OK, this looks pretty interesting. Like we have one spike for this in instance here, like infra, pet clinic, MySQL, CC, something. Um, you could either just filter down on this instance here in the filter, or for more convenience, we can have a control here. Um, and I think this one was called, what was it? Infra, infra, pet clinic, MySQL, if I remember correctly. And I think it was CC. Yes, CC. This is the one I want, because this is probably slow. So we filtered down on this instance here now. And now, it's probably pretty obvious what is happening. So we have this one job here running. And here you also see where is your CPU spending its time. And then suddenly you see, OK, this is where the time is being spent, basically. So you have a regular snapshot job that is slowing down your entire database that is also going through your entire application. And we've basically followed that along here. So that's fine. But sometimes it's not the beta database. Sometimes it's something else. For example, let's say um, we have users, and the user calls support and says, like, your application has been slow in the last two weeks. And you're like, I'm not sure. Maybe where could we start looking? We could looking at tracing again. So let's, for example, go to our Java application and they said the last two weeks, right? So let's look at the last two weeks. So let's say um, two weeks ago. OK, we see lots of ups and downs. This is a bit hard to tell. Um, what you can also do is, since Elasticsearch, kind of the history where it all came from was search, the good thing is that you can always search on anything here. So for example, what is even suggested here is you look at the transaction duration that is greater than some number. So let's, let's do that. Um, that's transaction duration uh, microseconds. If I want every, all the transactions that are slower than two seconds, um, how many zeros do I need? Six, yes. One, two, three. One, two, three. Then we filter down on that, and we don't find anything. Why? Yes, exactly. This should probably be greater than or greater than equals, and not just two seconds, because two seconds exactly is also interesting, but probably not what your users were experiencing. Um, it's always nice to see that you're paying attention. Um, and then when we look at this one here, we see that there is exactly one method that is slow. And you can see over time, it wasn't called very frequently, but when it was called, it was really slow. And I can look into that one, and you can, for example, see, so these are the aggregations. So we had some that took 50 seconds, and this one here was still 25 seconds. So this is still pretty slow. And once it finished loading, um, it will call me the uh, call stack down here. And the call stack is actually very short. You can see this was the overall call. You can see it was. It got back a 400, which is weird. Why would it get a 400? We could even look at the error, but it's not telling us that much here. Um, and we can see where we spent all our time. We spent 26 seconds in validate zip code in this one call. And basically what we have here is we have validate zip code validator on line 33 and then 12. And by the way, you can define your own namespace, because most of the time you're probably interested in your own namespace for stuff and not the framework you're using. And this is exactly what we have done here. So it knows, because I've annotated my own namespace here, this is my namespace, and it will only show this by default. And then this is the framework that you're using in the background, so it will hide that by default. And I would be curious what is that one here. So let's, um, let's find validate zip code. And look at that one. And you can see here, OK, we return a match. And we have some regular expression here. And actually, this is the regular expression. Those who said they like writing regular expressions, um, maybe you can already see that this is a pretty bad regular expression. This is intentionally badly written. And to show you what is basically going wrong, so you're spending a lot of time in that zip code validation. And since we're capturing the actual request here, um, so if you look at the request here, you can see somewhere here we have a zip code. 
here's zip code. And you can see this is a very long zip code. And this is exactly the problem, that our regular expression for the zip code is very bad, and that's why this code is very slow in the end. And then you can fix the zip code. Is it a very made-up example that bad regular expressions might bring down your applications? Not really. Um, maybe you remember the Cloudflare outage recently? Like, I think it was this summer, where Cloudflare had the big outage, where some bad regular expression that they were deploying was taking down their entire service. So bad regular expressions are kind of a common thing. Um, if you like them, nice, um, but be careful to not take down your application here. Um, another thing that you could, for example, look at... Do we still have time? Yeah, we still have a couple of minutes. Um, that's good. Um, no, this is not the one I want. This is the, the final one I wanted to show. So, for example, here I've picked a special time frame because I have a hard time replicating that. Here I mean my React application. So this is the front-end side. Because every now and then some users complain that for them the application is slow. And we do tracing in Python, React, Angular, in all kinds of frameworks, just to give you a JavaScript example if that is more your thing. And we're doing the same thing, transaction duration. And this time I'll go for greater than five seconds. Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. I'll filter down on that one. And here, for example, you can see, um, I'm not sure what is happening. Like, it's lots of pages. It's not one that is slow, they're all slow. This is all terrible, basically. And let's look at one to figure out what is going on. So you can see here, obviously, there are no calls below this one here because we filtered those out. We've only got the slow calls now. And I don't know, you see here, this one, I don't know. This is spending a lot of time here, but I'm not really sure what is going on. Um, or let's look at on our editor page. Now it's lo loading or aggregating the right traces together from me for this page. You can see it was, bless you, only collected a couple of times. Um, and once it's done loading, come on. I think it also wants to go home. Um, this one is also interesting, but not the one I wanted. Let's go to back to the original one. Um, here, you can see there's nothing happening initially. And when you see that page, um, is anything sticking out to you here? Sorry? Yes, the user agent. This is um, somebody using a terrible browser that is probably not doing so well with React. Um, and this is why I have a hard time reproducing that on my laptop, because luckily I don't have um, Internet Explorer. Um, but we, I think we set up some virtual machine somewhere to actually create those. Um, and here you can then basically see, oh, Internet Explorer. And then, once you have that, you could, since this is all search, you could then say, like, oh, let's filter down on actual user agent and just search for Internet Explorer, and then you will find all kinds of slow queries for Internet Explorer. So this is kind of how to explore stuff. And since this is all based on search, um, uh, is that user agent name, I hope. Um, So this is just this page here, um, but you could probably see, let's try it out, if we go to the, one of the very slow calls, I hope, I haven't tested this before, um, this will be another Internet Explorer call. And then you would say, can, or then you can tell people basically, please change your browser, because we don't want to support this. Um, let's see, okay, this is already Internet Explorer 9, but it's not much better. Um, here that actually has another error inside. So here this was calling some 404 internally as well. Um, but you can even see like, okay, this is from my React application, this was calling a 404, and you can even see the code where this happened, and then you can figure out who wrote the bad code and who needs to fix the code here to actually see that. So that can all be aggregated. Finally, what you probably want to have is some uptime monitoring, and you can throw that in here as well. So. We have, it's called Heartbeat, it's just pinging things. It supports ICMP, TCP, HTTP, and HTTPS. It can even do basic auth, and it can check that a page has a certain string in it, etc. And here, um, you can see in the last 15 minutes, we have just been pinging these pages, but they are both up now, but this one has been down for a while. And you can <coughs> also see, um, if I would extend the time frame, we would probably have more services here. So if I say the last 15, month. I'm not even sure what we have been running in the last 15 months. Um, but 
this will now aggregate together all the heartbeat things that we have been doing in the last 15 months. And well, you can see these were all the services that we have been pinging over time. Um, and you, here you can just define one endpoint like a status page, and then in the status page you can check is it up or is it down, for example. Where would you run this pinger? Do you run this as part of your Kubernetes cluster as well? Yeah, ideally outside where you can also test something like here, this is already questionable because probably you want to have more of an end-to-end -end test that you also want to test stuff like DNS and maybe a, a TLS certificate. Um, and that's all you can do with the heartbeat as well. So if you run that externally, you could basically get your end user's view and see like, okay, DNS is working and the, t the certificate is still good and the service is actually responding. And then you could just say like, I'm interested in one specific service. Let's go back to the last 15 minutes, for example. Um, or last 15 hours. Let's see what has been running here. Hopefully. Okay, these are the services that have been running. And then you could, for example, just look at this one here. You can see, okay, now we're filtering down on that one. Um, even though it hasn't been running to a year ago. No, this is not what I want. Um, let's see, you should have been running in that time frame somewhere, ideally, maybe. No? For whatever reason, it doesn't load the proper time frame. But here you would then see, like, A, was it up or down? And B, um, also you would see, um, why are you doing this? I think it doesn't want to, to work anymore as well. Um, here would you would see A, pings over time, like in terms of latency, and you would also see, like, has it been green or not green, and has it been responding? And that's the general idea here. So. To more or less wrap up, I think we've covered pretty much everything else. You'll get the slides afterwards, so you get basically get an idea of, or you can remember all the steps that I've done. The general idea that we have a bit here is that you don't want to have X tools for X features that you want to have. We want to kind of like bridge these little islands to one bigger map. So that's kind of like the appeal that we try to have with our stack here, that you have one place where you can go and you can see, is my service up or down? What is in the logs? How long are the traces? Is any, if a user complains like, what is in their logs? You can just filter down to the username they provide. Or you can filter down to just the slow requests. Or you could look at the metrics like, do you have some resource starvation? Like, are you running out of memory or CPU? Or is your MySQL slow? Or any of these pieces of information you can combine. And then you see kind of more overall rather than having one little thing here and one little thing there that you always need to manually combine and jump around. That's the overall idea, basically. If you want to try it out at home, it's a slightly different environment and it's a bit locked down, but you can go to demo.elastic.co. This basically just locks you into a Kibana dashboard and you can just play around there and see if that makes sense for you. Um, this is the easiest way to get started with the entire stack here. Um, which will look something like this. So you will have lots of Kubernetes pods and Docker images to play around with. So if that is your thing, you can use all the metadata and go wild with those. Um, now, we have pretty much five minutes left for questions. Do we have any questions? Yeah.